Hey everyone, in this video we're going to take a look at chapter 33 from the Road to Latin textbook. Now this story is called De Urbis Novi Loco One. And if you want more resources, I always tell you at the start of these videos, you can go to my website, um, take a look, you'll find the story, translations, um, grammar notes, vocab, a bunch of stuff that might help you through. So if you're just looking to get more like resources, um, you know, for, to use this textbook, feel free to go after it, um, or just to see the a digital um, form of the story, whatever you need. Before we dive in, um, what I always tell you when we start a new chapter, I'm gonna walk you through a bit of the grammar. But before you do that, you always wanna make sure that you have the vocab under control. And again, you can check my textbook to get it. Um, but it's really hard to understand what's going on if you don't know what the words mean. So you should always start there, find a, a vocab list, do a quiz lit, practice however you want, flashcards, whatever it is that you need. So you at least know what the words mean. And then you can dive into the grammar and try to unpack it and, and see how it all functions in the context of the story. That's always the best way to do it. I'll walk you through the grammar in a second, but feel free to check out my site to do that on your own. Another thing I'd recommend you do is if you're a student in class, find a partner um, that you can read this story to each other. So you read it to them, um, you practice your pronunciation, your speaking skills, they read it back to you and now you're working on your listening skills. You always want to incorporate that when you're trying to read Latin. Otherwise, you're just translating in your head, which is fine. You'll probably understand it. It's just not the best way to learn a language. So you never want to shut off those speaking and listening skills and it'll help you with your overall reading comprehension. So I always encourage you to do that. The last thing I'd say is when you try to unpack this story, make sure you're trying the read and reread method. So read through it once, write down any problem areas you have, fix those problem areas, right? You can use my textbook, the grammar notes, whatever to figure it out and then go back and read the story again a second a third, fourth time, as many times as you need to. And every time you're writing down problem areas, that list of problems should get shorter and shorter until you're able to read through this whole story without needing any help from a, a dictionary, no grammar help, anything like that. That's how you know you're in a really good place and you'll be ready to move on and that you're understanding the concepts in the chapter. Okay. So like I said, we're going to start with a quick look at the grammar. Now, this grammar is, is pretty straightforward. It's on demonstratives, right? Demonstrative pronouns. So you have three of them. You have hic, ille, and iste. And they all function in a, in a sort of similar way, but they mean different things. So I'm just going to give you a quick overview here. You can find more on the textbook, um, more, more explanations of it. But in general, you want to remember that pronouns stand in for nouns. We've been talking about that for a few chapters now. Demonstrative pronouns come from the Latin demonstrare, which means to point out or to show. It's how you make a distinction between objects that are close to you or further away. So I always tell my students, imagine a scenario where there's, you know, two dogs, okay? One is right next to you and one is, you know, across the street. If you say, hey, do you see the dog? How are they supposed to know which one you're talking about, right? There's two of them. That gets a little confusing. So what you'd say in English is, do you see this dog or do you see that dog? So this and that are ways of distinguishing between something that's closer to you and something that's further away. Okay, these are what the demonstratives hick and ille do. So hick hike hoke means this. That's the, the you know the thing of the person that's close to you. Ille illa illud is, is meaning um, it's for talking about something that's farther away from you. It means that. Okay. And by the way, ille illa illud is where you get um, basically the words for the in a lot of the Romance languages. So le, la, el, um, they come from this. They really mean that, right? So when in French or Spanish you're saying le or la um, or el, you're saying the something or that something. Um, that's where they come from. So a fun little connection for you if you're studying a, a Romance language at the same time. Okay. So hick and ille go together, right? This, that, pretty straightforward. As long as you remember, um, you know, which one is further away and which one's closer, there's really no way to, to mess it up. The third one here is iste, ista, stood. This is something a little bit different. Um, it's not so much for pointing out. I mean, you still are referring to something that's closer to you, but it has more of a tone to it or sort of a mood. It's when you're, you're expressing scorn or anger or dismissal, right? You're kind of making fun of something. So it means this, right? Um, and you can usually translate it as this of yours, but it's definitely got a negative connotation. So the way you'd use it in English is if you said something like, oh, look at this, look at this little book of yours, right? It's kind of meaning like you, you think it's stupid and you're not really liking it. Um, that's when you see in Latin iste, right? It kind of means like you're calling someone, um, I don't know if you're necessarily calling an idiot or not, that's not really right, but you're giving this dismissive tone of like, yeah, I don't really care. OK, so it falls into the same group. Um, you don't see it as much. I mean, you do see it. I think Hick and L.A. are much more common. But again, this chapter is trying to work you into it so you'll understand it as you go. OK, so here's the charts that will kind of help you through. And again, you want to practice this on your own. If you are using my textbook, there's Magistrula exercises and grammar exercises that will help you through. But in general, this is Hick High Coke. And when I say Hick High Coke, I'm talking about the masculine, feminine and neuter. Right. Because it depends on what you're talking about. If you're saying this man or this woman or this building, it would change the gender you're using. 
okay? So the singular is this, the plural is these. You'll notice that in the plural, right, the singular is kind of, um, you know, you just have to memorize it. There are some tricks, like the genitive, huyas, great word, um, is the same no matter what gender you're using, same with huik in the dative. Um, but there are little tells, like masculine will say um, hok, and uh, in the ablative singular, feminine will say hak. So the O and the A we've seen kind of uh, going with masculine and feminine, but you still just kind of have to memorize it. The plural is much easier. So the plural is using basically your, your noun and adjective endings first and second declension with the letter H in front of it. So you have he, horum, right? E, orum, e, sosis is the masculine plural. Um, I, orum, e, sosis is the feminine. The neuter, do you just have hike and hike? Remember for neuter, um, nominative and accusative are always the same thing, but it's still using orum, is, and is, right? So in other words, you're probably going to recognize these or get used to them a little bit easier because they're using similar endings. Okay, this is the chart for ille. Same idea, right? Nothing too crazy. The singular is a little different, right? You have ilius as the genitive across the genders. You have illi, the dative is the same. Um, but again, ilum with a un and ilam with an am, that's something we've seen before. I'm gonna try to help you distinguish between masculine and feminine, the o and the a. And again, the trick here is the plural is actually the exact same endings as hik hai kok, just with ill in front of it instead of h. So that's a trick that might help you through. But remember, um, ille means that, singular, and it means those when it's plural, right? So if you're saying, hey, look at those trees, you're pointing at something farther away and there's more than one. That's the general idea, okay? The last one, um, este esta stood, meaning that or that of yours, right? Um, this is how it works. It's the same thing. You're just kind of memorizing. But again, the pattern is the same, genitive and dative, the same uh, singular across the genders. It doesn't really matter. You're seeing O's for masculine, A for feminine, pretty straightforward. Um, and then you have those endings again in the plural, E or amisosis, I or amisosis. You're just sticking IST in front of it. Okay. And for the neuter, it's actually easier because it's using A or amis, A is. We've seen that A representing um, second declension, non plural and accusative plural. So it's a long way of saying for all three of these, um, uh, these pronouns, you're probably going to get um, used to the endings a lot quicker than with other things, because even though it is new, it's a little bit different. Um, it's using a lot of the same endings. Okay, that's a quick overview. I'll point it out as we go through the stories. But if you need more information on it, again, I'll keep pointing you back to the textbook just because you can find all my notes there, videos, whatever. It might help you through. But at this point in the video, before you go on, you should feel really good about the vocab, really good about the grammar, and you want to practice a story in your own with that read and reread method. And once you hit a point where you feel good, then continue the rest of this video so you can match up what you did against what I did and feel like you've got it under control. Okay, so I'll assume that's where we are and we'll keep moving. The story starts like this. You have Romulus et Remus, Victoria Magna, Laiti, cum avo suo, al by longai, manserant. So he's saying Romulus and Remus, right? They manserant, they stayed, okay? Um, or remained, you, you, you might say. They stayed in Alba Longa, right? So Alba Longa is your um, locative here. That's where they are. They stayed with their, their awo, right? Awo suo, with their grandfather, right? Numitor, because they had just got the kingdom back for him. And they're described as being Laiti Victoria Magna. So they're happy from the great victory. So if you put it all together, you could say Romulus and Remus, happy from the great victory, stayed in Alba Longa with their grandfather. Then you have said desiderabant agros et monte suos itaque revenerant ad loca in quibus ei pueri et adulascentes habitavera. So you're saying, but they were desiring or they desired agros and montes, right? So they wanted fields and mountains of their own, right? Suos, their own fields and mountains. They wanted their own place to live is the idea. Itaque, just meaning and so, um, revenerant. So they left, they departed, um, or sorry, they returned rather. Um, to the places in which they, so you have, uh, they return to the loca, to the places, remember it's neuter plural, in which, right, it's just the relative uh, pronoun here, so in which they, and then you have sort of a side note, boys and young men, it almost means like as boys and young men, habita where, where they had lived as boys and young men. So they go back to where they grew up, which um, you might remember from the story, they're found in the Tiber River, they're going back to where they got picked out of the, um, out of the river by the she-wolf. Okay, so, and whether it had Faustulus too. So you have praeteria amore libitatis um, suam urbam et regnum cupiebon. So uh, uh, besides, right, um, praeteria, so uh, moreover, you might even say, um, or besides, uh, they, uh, well, they, cupiebon, they were desiring a kingdom. Right. So uh, they were designing a regnum because of the amore libertatis. So um, because of the love of freedom. Right. You might say they desired suam urbam. They desired their own uh, city and their own regnum, their own kingdom. OK, so you have the praetoria giving them moreover and the ablative meaning um, because. Right. So because they uh, they, they were desiring um, or you might even say because the love of liberty, freedom. Right. They want to be free and have their own place. 
Then you end uh, the paragraph with this. You have said fratres de urbis no why loco inter se dis, uh, dissentiebant. There we go. She's so saying, but the brothers um, dissentiebant, they were disagreeing, right? Or they disagree um, inter se among themselves. So they're having this dissension among themselves. They can't figure out uh, about or concerning day, right? About the location, the loco of the new city. Urbis no why is genitive here. So they were dissenting or disagreeing about the location of the new city. So now we're getting into the next part of the story you probably heard of Romulus and Remus building the city of Rome and the argument they have. That's what we're getting at. Okay, and you can see in the picture here um, from the textbook, they're kind of plotting out where Rome is going to be. Then you go to the next part, right, the next paragraph, and you have a quote. You have hic mons, in quote Romulus, est locus urbi no why idoneus. So he says, this hill, it's not really a mountain, um, that's not really what it is, it's more like a hill. So he says, this hill, said Romulus, is a suitable location, locus idoneus, a suitable, a suitable location for the new city. Remember, idoneus, suitable, takes a data for it, suitable for the new city or to the new city. Okay, so he says this one's the good one. And he says, Latera huius montes sunt alta et hostes prohibebo. Okay, so the sides, um, and notice by the way with Hikmons, this mountain, there's your demonstrative, right? This one, the one that he's standing on. Um, he says, Latera, the sides of it, right? Huius, um, uh, of this one, you might say. It's genitive singular, and again, it's the hik hike hoke demonstrative. So he's saying, the sides of this uh, of this hill, right? Huius Montes, right, of this hill, are alta, they're, they're high, and hostes prohib uh, prohibebo, and they um, will prohibit the enemy. Right? So he says the sides are good, meaning the slopes of the hill are high, and it will prevent the enemies, meaning they're going to have a tough time uh, climbing up it. Okay? Then he says, Proximum quick monti est flumen magnum quo naves ad terras extremas navigabum. So close to this hill, right? Quick monti, again, it's the dative form of hic hike hoke. Okay? And remember, proximum takes a date of near to. So close to or near to this hill, there is a flumen magnum, a great river, which is the Tiber River, right, where they were uh, kind of um, not born, but where they were thrown into. So it's as close to this uh, hill as a big river um, in which the ships, right, the Nawes, um, Nawigabun, they will sail to terras extremas, um, uh, to far off lands. So he's saying the river is good because we can get ships out and it goes out to the Mediterranean Sea and they're going to they're gonna sail away, right, to these, these far off places. Okay, and again, notice quick there in that sentence. It's again dative of hic haiko. Then you have praeterea ad hunc montem a, fas, a faustulo portati sumus et in hoc monte tot anos habitavimus. So he says, besides or moreover, right? Praeterea. Um, uh, he says, we were carried portati sumus. There's the perfect tense passive voice. Notice how portati is plural. It's referring to the two boys. So we were carried a faustulo by faustulus to this mountain, ad hunc motem, ad montem. Notice hunk there. Again, it's the accusative singular of hic hike hoke. So as you demonstrative to this hill, right? Again, he's pointing to the one that's closest to him because he's standing on it. Um, and he says, and in, uh, in hoc monte, so on this mountain, again, there's the ablative of hic hike hoke. So on this hill, um, habitavamus, we lived for tot anos for so many years. Okay, the tot is so many. Remember, the accusative shows duration of time. So he says, this is the hill that we lived on for so many years, right, with Faustulus. Then he ends by saying, hoc in loco urbem noam condemos. So uh, in this place, again, hoc there is the ablative singular of hic hoc, hoc hoc loco. So in this place, we will condemos, we will found or create or establish an urbem noam, a new city. So Romulus is pointing to, uh, to this hill and he says, this is the one we're going to build on. And um, here's all the reasons why. Okay. Then we have the next paragraph, the response. Um, you have istis causis non aducor respond at Remus. Hic mons est alto sed non est aequus. So he, he responds, um, or Romulus responds, and notice how he's using istis, right? That's that sort of like pejorative, like, you know, dismissive tone, right? Um, and he says, non aducor, I'm not moved, right? I'm not like moved by what you're saying. The, uh, sorry, the ablative here is saying by what? And he says, by the causes, causis. But notice how he uses the dismissive tone, istis causis. I'm not not, I'm not moved by your little your little reasons, right? These reasons of yours. Um, that it's talking about these reasons, the one close. Again, how can you be close to a reason? But he's talking about the ones that Romulus just said. But notice how he uses the dismissive tone. Okay, so one way to translate is I'm not moved by these reasons of yours, right? He's dismissing them. And he says, Hick Mons, right? This mountain 
is uh, is high, altus, right? It's a high hill, um, but it's not equus. It's not level. So he's like, yeah, it's a it's a tall hill, but it's not a level hill. Why would we build here? And he continues and says, Elemons, right? And notice how he's used the demonstrator, that hill, right? He's pointing to something now, not th not Hickmons, this hill, but Elemons, that one. So he says, Elemons est altus et aequus est, okay? So he says, that hill over there is altus, right? It's high and it's level, right? Aequus est. So he says, that's the one. Agri, Ilius monti sunt lati, okay? So the agri, the fields of that mountain or of that hill, right? Notice Ilios, it's the genitive singular. It's going with montis, right? It means of that. So the, the fields of that hill are, are wide. They sunt uh, lati, right? They're wide. So he says, this is going to be really good, okay? And he says, flumen es proximum ili monti, quoque et hostes prohibebe. So he says, the river is close to that mountain or to that hill, ili monti, right? It's dated. Um, quoque also. So he says, yeah, it also is close to the river, right? The river is going between the two hills, okay? So he says, and it will prohibit pro, or prevent, prohibebe, right? It will prevent the enemy, right? He, uses the, he says, that's a really good hill too. Why wouldn't we use that one? Itaque ad ili montem pro, uh, properabimus et ilo in loco urbem noam condemus. Okay, so he ends by saying, and so, properabimus, he says, we will hasten to that uh, hill, illum multum, uh, montem, right? He's pointing to, he says, we're going to go to that hill. And in that location, illo loco, again, notice how it's playing off what Romulus said. Romulus said, hoc in loco on this place. Remus says, illo in loco, in that place. So in that place, we will establish or we will found an urbem noam, a new city. So here we have the two brothers. They're just not agreeing on what they're going to do, right? Which is the, the famous Romulus and Remus story. Then you have Sic Romulus, de legit montem quem poste a Romani palatium apelaba. Okay, so in this way or thus, Romulus chose, right? Romulus de legit, he chose the hill, which afterwards, right? Quem poste, right? Quem is referring to the mountain or the hill. He says the hill, which afterwards the Romani, the Romans, um, uh, called the Palatine, right? So in other words, it will be called, uh, sorry, the hill, which they will call, um, or they were calling the Palatine. Okay, so. You know, he says further on in the future, they're going to call this the Palatine Hill. That's Romulus's choice, right? The Palatine Hill is a famous one in, in Rome, okay? Then you have Remus autem montem, qui postea apelebator aventinos de lege. Okay, so Romulus chose a hill, which the Romans, you know, were calling the Palatine Hill afterwards. Remus, however, right, Autem, Remus, however, chose the hill. Uh, he he delegate Montem. He chose the hill, which afterwards, here we're just using the passive, Apelebator, was called Aventinus, the Aventine. Okay, so these are the two famous hills of Rome, of the seven hills. These are two of them um, with the river going through, uh, you know, the middle of it. Romulus chooses the Palatine. That's going to be where they built the city. Remus chooses the Aventine, which will also uh, be part of Rome, too. It's just not the one that uh, that wins out in this argument. OK, so we're about halfway through the story of Romulus and Remus. We'll finish it with the next uh, story in this chapter. But you can see throughout the story, it was mixing in Hick. Ile, a little bit of este. I think we saw it once, but enough to kind of give you a sense of what it would be. But you got some good repetition of how to say this and that and to see the difference between them, right? This is something close to you. That is something further away. If you have any questions at all on the grammar, the translation, anything like that, feel free to put it in the comments below. I'm happy to help you. But otherwise, just keep practicing. The more you do this and the more repetition you give yourself, the easier it, be uh, the easier it becomes. Good luck.